Um, we have a topic that I think is, you know, contemporary in that most of us here, right, lived through the Berlin Wall. Some of us were born when it came up. Most of us were certainly cognizant of, of it coming down and, and more importantly of, of what this symbolized. So in terms of icons, in terms of historical symbols, and as a historical process itself, I mean, the construction of the wall was the physical symbol of the separation between East and West. When President John F. Kennedy visits Berlin in 1963, you know, he's going to, you know, make that very clear. This is the dividing line between East and West. And he's very prescient, because 25 years later, when the wall comes down, you know, he says, those of us who were here will know that when this wall comes down, when this structure comes down, that freedom will have returned to these areas. So in that sense, the wall, of course, is very much right, inherent in Cold War history, but you know, the contemporary ramifications are there. Um, we discuss walls a lot today in, in the media, in, in politics, and uh, I'll try to remain a as apolitical as possible, but I guess <laughs> if, if I could construct one adage, adage for us today is that um, walls do work, uh, but rarely for very long. Um, because, and, and I'm going to paraphrase uh, an individual you'll be hearing from in a minute, uh, walls are, are never an impediment to the will of the people. Um, and this is a, a pure example of that. Well, because France is, is Germany's lifelong neighbor, and, and Germany's oftentimes rival. But if anyone's going to be interested in seeing Germany rehabilitated, because that was the plan here, let's bring Germany back, let's re re recuperate, rehabilitate, help it recover, and then we will have a strong sovereign nation um, right there in Central Europe. Stalin was given a portion of Germany and he was asked <laughs> one promise. Um, here, Joe, here's your slice of Germany. Just make sure it doesn't become communist. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's like asking, inviting the wolf into the hen house and asking it not to take a bite. Um, and so very quickly we see um, <laughs> the German zone uh, under Russian occupation uh, become a communist state. So um, the division now becomes clear. The realization becomes paramount that any hopes that a post-war cooperation are done. Some historians in retrospect blame uh, Franklin Roosevelt for being too naive, too optimistic. Uh, I think Perhaps, perhaps. I think, I think you, you have to keep in mind the post-war mentality, this, this euphoria, this, this hope that things could be better, and so maybe we can't fault our, our leaders for, for hoping that you know, things had somehow changed. But again, I apologize for my language, but once an asshole, always an asshole, and, and nothing had changed for Joseph Stalin other than uh, Hitler was gone. Um, but the new president, Harry Truman now, is the one who has to confront this reality that you can't trust Stalin any further, you can throw him. So what do we do about Stalin? Um, but the Marshall Plan was a way, um, politically, it was explained to the American people um, that close to $3 billion worth of American aid was going to be sent to the nations of Europe uh, in order to help them recover after World War II. And on the one hand, that was certainly accurate, um, but of course, what we also understand is that by rebuilding these areas, so those in the yellow, um, the, the uh, United States government was attempting to create stable economic and political governments which would then be less vulnerable, less susceptible to communist influence. Um, so the Marshall Plan, you know, on the one hand altruistic, on the other hand, this is our way of kind of making sure that everyone's staying on our side. So all you had to do to receive Marshall Plan Aid, and this wasn't just money, this was farm equipment, this was, look, uh, we're sending shovels, we're sending guys with shovels, we're sending all sorts of bags of stuff. There's care. You ever wondered what care looks like? This is care. <laughs> uh, I zoomed in on this part of the, look how excited, <laughs> I guess I had about a bar of soap. See the starkest difference. Here is where East meets West. Here is where the residents of East Berlin can see clearly how things are different in spite of the best efforts of the communist authorities 
their propaganda to convince the people of East Germany, of East Berlin, that they're living in a socialist paradise. All you have to do, um, as one resident put it, all you had to do is, is take a subway, one stop, and you were in an entirely different world. Uh, Western commercialization, uh, Western goods, which were in abundance, and East Germany and East Berlin, which is quickly turning into a third world state. Um, the United States attempts to prop up the Western Berlin zone because by late 1947, all of Germany is hit with an economic recession. Uh, inflation goes up, purchasing power is at an all time low, and so the United States, in order to buffer its part, because again, the United States' concern was if West Berlin's economy should falter, then this would give opportunity for the East to swoop in. So, so the West issues their own currency. The German currency at the time was the mark. The United States introduces the Deutsche Mark, which just means German mark. Um, but the, the Deutsche Mark is supported by US dollars, um, which makes it seven times more valuable than the original German currency, seven times. And as a resident of West Berlin, you were given a one-to-one -one exchange rate. So you bring your old marks into the bank. Imagine that. You show up with a $10 bill. They gave you 70 bucks. <laughs> Not bad. And now you can travel back to East Germany and buy up all the goods you want. Um, and so this, of course, undermines Russian control of their own economy. Stalin is upset. Stalin wants to reassert his authority. And <clears throat> did I mention Stalin's an asshole? <laughs> The result is, as many of you know, a complete blockade of West Berlin. All road, rail, uh, water access into West Berlin are cut off. Stalin, essentially, demonstrating what a swell guy he is, is ready to starve West Berlin into submission unless the United States removes its uh, fiscal policies. But we know what comes next. This is one way still into Berlin, and one way in which the Allies were willing to call Stalin's bluff <clears throat> through the skies. Um, and so beginning in 1948, um, American and British planes embarking from West Germany begin dropping supplies into West Berlin. And we were willing to call Stalin's bluff principally because we knew Stalin wasn't ready for a war yet. Because uh, we still had an ace in the hole for at least another year. 